All right, guys, welcome back to the rhythm section, brought to you by the Mind Refinery. I'm Kyle Bodanis. Corbin and I are back at it again after a little break for the holidays uh, with our inaugural year in spectacular, the Rhythm Section Album Draft, where we each pick our 10 favorite albums of the year, along with some honorable mentions and a couple things we hated. The honorees are curated into a playlist that we put together. Uh, you can find it in our description or on our social media. It's two hours of some of our favorite music from this year. We hope you enjoy it. We had a lot of fun doing this episode and putting the list together. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And if you have time, follow the Minor Refinery on social media. And now, here's the show. All right, guys, uh, the moment has arrived. We're doing our first inaugural year in review podcast, breaking down our top 10 favorite albums uh and the ones we hate as well with me as usual is my partner in musical crime coburn blair coburn how's it going good how about you oh you know lockdown um seems like a never-ending story yeah i mean this was kind of interesting this is our first time doing this we do not know what each other is going to pick and if we if there is overlap for example if I picked an album, and Coburn picked the exact same album. Coburn then has to sub in another album for that. We have a list of honorable mentions to help do that. Are we going to announce that we've had to sub in one? I think we should, obviously. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to announce that this, is, this has been a sub. Okay, fantastic. Now, the first thing I want to do is briefly talk about what went into these decisions. How did you decide what your favorites were? Was it just feel? What was the criteria? So I think it's feel um, for me like think these are albums that I kept revisiting and and kept coming back to and albums that like stayed with me throughout the course of the year, which is like, you know, been an extremely tur- turbulent year. There's a lot of things been happening. It's, it's interesting to see like, you know, what albums lasted. I went back to during the duration of this out al- this year. Yeah. Same here. Uh, the kind of the, I mean, we talk about this a lot on the podcast is just are you know, how much have we lived with an album? How much have we enjoyed it? How much has it stuck with us? we didn't just listen to it and then say whatever, you know, like how has it become part of our, our lives? And that's really important for me. I also, I also tie it a lot to like the, the good conversations I've had about the album too. Was it surprising how good it was? Because there were some really big surprises this year that kind of caught me off guard. I'm like, wow, I really, really, really enjoyed that and didn't expect to. So yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that's what it was. It's, you know how much how much are you living with it? How much is it does does an album become a part of you? Because like, is it gonna is it gonna last into the new year? So let's get started. Let's get started with our number ten. Why don't you kick off this extravaganza? So at number ten, I have Drake's Dark Lame demo tapes. Um, so that is the the album of B sides and leaked songs that came out. I believe it was like early on in the pandemic sometime in the, in the summer I should probably all have my release dates up but I thought this album as much as it's a throwaways from an artist like Drake I thought it was impactful he was testing a few different things on there he had like you know some songs that were really big and I think it would have done a lot better if we weren't in the pandemic you know the album came out in May Twisty Slide was a you know a smash success before that but I think the song that resonated most with me was a song called Deep Pockets, which Drake appropriates. He's appropriating Young Tony's Rollin' from, you know, a mixtape back in, you know, 2007 or 2006. Um, and he kind of is, you know, interpolating that on the chorus. And it's, you know, really Toronto track and it, it really stick, stuck with me. So what uh, what is your top, your uh, number 10 pick there? Number 10 is Amine and Limbo. Uh, this is one of the most head bobbing things ever. I ranked, and we both ranked albums higher than this that won't be on my list. But in terms of like my sensibilities in hip hop, I like how weird Amine is. I like how chilled out this album is. I love the dedication, you know, to Kobe on it. And um, there's this song, the opening track, Burden. I fucking absolutely love. It's it, it's really, 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 really great. Also, there's this song called Pressure in My Palms. We talked about it. Slow tie feature with within Staples. And I feel like this was one of my smoke a bong and chill out and listen to albums in the evening. Like, it really had a very specific feel to it. And... um. And all the all the other stuff that came along with it, like the um, like the art he did, and uh, and, and you know the the short movie and all that kind of stuff. I really liked it. The like the whole it made the whole thing an experience. 
And I guess that's something else that goes into it is um, what is the experience of listening to the album that comes from the artist as well. So I like I really, really enjoyed this and it just kind of stuck with me, even though some albums that we reviewed this year was technically were, were technically better. But this one really got me. What is your number nine? So at number nine, I have uh, Frosty and his album called Under Surveillance. So Frosty's a UK drill standout. He released a song called County Lines um, some years ago. And then from there, he kind of, I think he was, he was in jail when the song kind of came up and blew out. Um, and he was recently released and he's kind of maintained his buzz in the UK drill scene. And I think for a genre like drill, sometimes we don't really get the albums that we, you know, should get. Or, you know, I think the genre can be a little bit singles based at times. So to see someone kind of make a full album out of the genre and do it correctly and, you know, have different notes in there while, you know, maintaining the elements of the genre that, you know, make it what it is. So I thought I thought it was a standout for me in that way. And uh, I really love the song called Snowballs on the album. You know, I've really and I'm sure it will come up again. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know UK hip hop and drill and just the whole UK music scene more. Um, you know, from a hip hop standpoint, it's been really, really awesome. And uh, this is another fantastic record. My number nine is blue and exiles miles from an interlude called life. I absolutely loved this album. It was fucking fantastic. What I liked about it is that it was like an exploration. It was an exploration of their influences in music. And it was released 13 years to the day to the first album, which is incredible which for some reason the album name is escaping me right now. Um, uh, Bo- Below the Heavens? Yes, Below the Heavens. Anyways, Below the Heavens is a fantastic hip-hop album. It's definitely one of the best. Um, one of the best, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely one of the best that's come out in a long time. Absolutely for its decade, 2007. Uh, fantastic. And I really, 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 really liked on this is that they talk about how they got to here. They are exploring people like Miles Davis and John Coltrane. And you're, and it's it's like this super nerdy hip hop album that's jazz influenced, that's soul influenced, and it really kind of takes you on this like musical journey. And when I got into hip hop, I got into it because of like Native Tongues and like Tribe Called Quest, and and like Black Sheep and like things like that. Just like stealing my aunt, who's like my older sister's uh, CDs, and listening to them. And this kind of took me back to that with just like a, with a crisper, uh, you know, more modern production style. I absolutely fucking love it. it. It was really fantastic. This was another one of those listening to at night albums. And um, I, I just I just think that they continue to be super creative. And and also, like what I really liked about this is somehow, despite being uh, way too many tracks long, it like each moment you're not it's not a tough listen to like you're getting through a good 90 minutes of music fairly effortlessly so i appreciated that i thought it was amazing i really can't see wait to see uh what these guys do next so at number eight i have ama ray's the angel you don't know which is her debut studio album she's uh both Ghanaian and american born in new york and kind of fluidly back between Atlanta. Um, New York and Accra and Ghana. And I thought this album was just fan- fantastic. Did not listen to it. I like I think I think this album like if you you should do yourself a favor and go back and and spend some time with this one cuz I thought this album was really really great and does a really good job at kind of breaking down the borders between worlds and it's such a it plays into, you know, androgyny and, you know, singing songwriting and you know, playing across the diaspora. And it was like a really like a mind blowing album. And the video work for this album was really great as well. Um, I think my standout track from this album was either Trust Trust Fund Baby or Jump and Chip. Yeah, this album, you know, came out at a perfect time for me. And I really just sank, sank my teeth into this. Now I got to check that one out. Fantastic. So my number eight is Unlocked by Denzel Curry and Kenny Beats. Uh, this was short, sweet, and to the point, Kenny Beat said that they were really channeling MF Doom on this one in the studio, which completely makes sense. It's raw as fuck. I know Alphonse Pierre from Pitchfork said the producing was a little too neat, but I felt the production style gave space for Curry to do his thing and kind of paint all over it. Like, if you listen to Take It Back, it's a very simple beat, and that allows 
Curry to kind of change pace and articulation and play vocal effects. But at the same time, I wonder too, like, what would it be like if it was a more uh, raw, more RZA, you know, in the vein of RZA? But I loved it. I thought Denzel Curry is, at, you know, getting to the the height of his powers. And it's a really fucking awesome album that I've been loving all year. And I love all his fucking records. But this one is just so, it's like a condensed diamond of goodness. And I've been on the Denzel train since the beginning. I'm continuing Kenny Beats is also fucking fantastic. This one I'm going to be listening to for a long time, and I keep listening to it, especially when I need to, like, be pumped up, be intense. Like, this is not your chill-out album, but it's it's fantastic. So I think my number seven is going to be a pick that you might might force you to sub something out. I have uh, Benny the Butcher's Burden of Proof. Fuck! Um, which we talked about on the podcast, and I think we both gave it a great review. Um, I'm not sure where you had it. I think that's going to be the interesting thing. But yeah, I thought this album was just fantastic. You know, really getting back to the grittiness of New York rap and not New York City. I mean, the state in that sense. I think it's, you know, excellent. A lot of the features were really good on it. And, you know, Hit Boy and um, former guest of the show, Jansport J on here. Um, And it was really just a fantastic album. So I, I have it at number seven for me on my list. Uh, so, uh, Benny the Butcher was my number six on this list. I did have it. I don't want to steal too much of your thunder here with the selection because that's part of the game. But if Hit Boy isn't producer of the year, I don't know who is. Yeah, I think I think that's a really fair fair shot. Yeah, I'd be I'd be hard pressed to say someone who had a better twenty twenty than Hit Boy. Um, and we'll look to see what he kind of comes with this year, twenty twenty one. Also, the shout outs to Westside Gun and Conway the Machine for just being on this, doing the Griselda thing. Loved it. My number seven is probably going to be on your list. Send them to Coventry by Pasalu. The one thing that's been great about this year is I spend a lot of time, as you mentioned, with the Frosty album, is getting to know British hip hop and having time to, you know, immerse myself in it as much as I can do from Canada during a pandemic. This album wore its influences on his sleeve. We both loved it. It was raw, it was honest, and even though it drew comparisons to J Huss. You know, it definitely was something on it, right on its own. What also really helped me get in the right headspace for it to enjoy it was the conversation we had with Nicholas Terrell, who just continues to be talented and uh, and classy and charming. Uh, he kind of helped to me into some of the more subtle nuances. And I think when you start to listen to the nuances, you start to appreciate things more. And I think this is an example of like one of the true joys of conversing about music because it helps you appreciate things that you maybe don't have a quite understood, haven't quite understood yet, or can like help accentuate an experience you've already had, which is in this example, this. Uh, So I'm definitely going to be watching now uh, Pasalu's career moving forward. And the mix, this mixtape cemented it. I absolutely loved it. It was a breath of originality. He really, really is playing with different cadences and meter and he's rapping in and out of the beat and he's just weaving his way through it and it's absolutely fantastic yeah so i'm gonna have to probably make a like a 74th minute sub so i'll let you know when uh when my pick comes up yeah um for that so my number six pick is probably i think it's gonna be on your list as well um so i have taylor swift's folklore at number six so i think this was uh an excellent album by her she you know, really set the tone for, you know, the latter half of the year. I think it came out a little bit too early, if anything, but she quickly capitalized on that by giving us Evermore. And I think it's a really good place for her in her career and just a really good setting of the tone. And we can kind of see where she might go to next. Okay, so you chose that. I fucking loved it. It's, I mean, I was completely blown away by how good it was. It's absolutely fantastic. My number six is Paul McCartney 3. Paul McCartney, first of all, my relationship with Paul McCartney has been a tumultuous one early on because I, you know, had the um, wannabe hipster opinion that uh, Paul McCartney shit. Wings is the best band of all time? uh, Yes, Wings is absolutely the biggest toilet. Uh, It's one of my least favorite post. Okay, so like uh the whole like baby i'm amazed i think is one of the most brilliant songs ever written definitely one of the most greatest love stories but that's like paul mccartney but then you have the wings that comes out they release band on the run and that is absolute toilet i fucking hate band on the run this who is doesn't a... like band on the run band, band on, on the run is a great song. band on the run is like, like the best Beatles. song of all time no it's like 
it's one of the i am my eyes just popped out of my fucking head anyways who doesn't like band on the run it's like what's not to like it's like beatles reo speedwagon uh, oh I hate the God. I hate the fucking I hate the wings. The only w- w- thing I like about the wings is uh, the live and let die cover. I enjoy that. I prefer like the the Paul McCartney non wings, especially since like, I'm exploring that. W- when he collaborated with Kanye West, is that your favorite Paul? No, McCartney? definitely <laughs> not the Kanye West. Uh, um, Era. The, he, <laughs> and then, okay, so uh, it's like I like the Baby MMA is like the first post Beatles album where it's like him and Linda they're doing their thing. I find it very charming. Anyways, I but I, I had been very anti Paul McCartney for a long time, mostly because of the Wings. I was a big John Lennon fan, and then I really started learning he really beat the shit out of his wife, first wife. So I'm like fuck that. So uh, what happened was I started re- liking Paul McCartney again, and his album Paul McCartney Three that came out this year, absolutely fantastic and. What I liked about it was, and in the interviews, he talks a lot about it, that he was kind of just kicking around at home, and he's like, there's nothing to do, so I'm going to just make music. And that's what musicians do. I mean, it wasn't calculated. It wasn't this thing. It's like, I have the time. I have the resources. I'm just going to make an album. And it is completely something uh, different. It is um, more stark at times. Uh, electronic influences some like almost like industrial sounding uh stuff and i was just very 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 surprised that he went you know in this direction and i i thought it was i mean i was really 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 impressed i i think anybody who hasn't heard uh the new paul mccartney album paul mccartney 3 listen to it it is at a time when he should be making absolutely fucking terrible music and we talk about this a lot at the podcast like what is there to do if you're a musician you know what i mean at this point in your career where you're like pushing 80 and what is the what is the end game with it and for him it's just i'm a musician that's what i do and that's it and it's really good i would check it out it's fantastic I'll and, have and, to... and fuck the wings <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to maybe give that a listen. I, I haven't probably listened to Paul McCartney intentionally in like a number of years. It happens accidentally so, a lot. Yeah, accidentally all the time, but intentionally, it's a different story. So what is your number five? My number five pick, we're already there already, eh? So my number five pick is by a rapper named Tamir, and the album is called Don't Let Your Fear Kill You. Um, So I thought this album... That album's on my list. I got a sub now. Oh, it made your list too. Yeah, it's three down. That's what I get for going um going first. Maybe we should have switched up at five. So you go first. No, nah, whatever. I'm versatile. Yeah, I thought that album. I thought it was like a really mind blowing album to me. I thought he did a really good job at painting pictures and giving me a side of storytelling that you don't really get. I'm not hearing too often um in Toronto rap scene. I love the song Sugar and Carlos and a nod to the iconic YTV host. He just did a really good job of painting pictures and storytelling um, in a way that I was uh, really surprised by and really enjoyed. I What's switch your, it. Uh, your number five then? Uh, okay. You switch so, it? Are you switching no, 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 on the fly? No, no, no. Okay, 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 okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I got fucking, I got poise. Uh, my number five is RTJ. Is this the sub? This is the, I had, I had this as honorable mention. Okay, so you have to announce this album and what you're switching in, in uh, yeah. Okay, so this Tamir album you just announced uh, is actually my number five. So RTJ4 is in there. Um, the only reason I didn't have this as one of my top albums, not because it's one of, not one of my top albums, but because I feel like it's a continuation of other RTJ albums. And it's like almost like how... Can I judge that fairly? Because I love RTJ. I'm so like invested in their sound. It's fucking all. Uh, I really loved it. The album's perfect for the times. A lot of it was put together before the whole George Floyd thing happened. Not that what happened with George Floyd is yep. anything new. Um, it's fucking the same tragedy that's been continue unfolding for, I don't know, 400 years. Uh, but this album felt completely of its time. And uh, we talked about the new Public Enemy album. And we, when we talked about it, we were talking about like who is their heir to the throne. And for me, it's RTJ. And uh, this was just a continuation of that. It was intense. Um, the end track, it's, it, it's fucking incredible. And um, I just really, really, really enjoyed it. So at my number four, I'm coming in um, with an album by 
a Croydon based rapper, George. Um, the album's called Almost an Adult, and it dropped on May 15th of this year. I thought it was a really, really good take on modern UK rap. The cinematography to the video, he made like a short film to accompany it. And I thought that was really what hooked me in. And then I kind of went back and and picked apart all the different pieces of the album. And I thought the production was really good. And I'm really a big fan of, you know, what's going on in South London. And I think there's been a lot of cool stuff coming from there. And I, and I think this is like a, a cool look at uh, UK rap that's not drill and it's not like maybe alternative rap or whatever you want to call it. So I think finding its own way. Um, so I'm excited to see what he does next this year. So I just want to mention about the Tamir thing. You also, I mean, you had sent me it yesterday and you're like, have you heard it? But you sent me it before and it was, oh, you're, I the did. One, you're the one who got me into it. So it's almost like you're, it's like the fucking bait and switch, son. Um, <laughs> so my number four is Alfredo by Freddie Gibbs and Alchemist. Freddie Gibbs consistently puts out great music. Bandana, Pinata with Mad Lib, his solo shit, like Freddie. Uh, you also have uh, You Only Live Twice, and of course his work with Alchemist, who produces Alfredo, and it's fucking ridiculous. Also, check out the 1985 video, because it's just them in a field, uh, him in a field rapping with like, they make a coke deal and improvise some dialogue. It's pretty fucking hilarious. Right from the opening guitar lines of that 1985, which is the opener, it's like this dramatic, um, eclectic, it's textured at times, it's menacing at other times, low-key album at other times, and it kind of represents the very best of what Gibbs and his flow and Alchemist and his productions are. I'm trying to, I, I think it might be his best album. I kind of like fucking Bandana. I think everyone's got their kind of, you know, their Freddie Gibbs thing. He does fucking sick features too. I mean, this is a guy who was dropped at his label at one point, and, uh, Definitely one of the best comeback stories in music. I mean, MF Doom, same story. And rises uh, to be considered one of the best in the game. And um, fucking hip hiccuping. And I was just blown away by this. And I think as soon as we met, I was right away being like, yo, this album's incredible, blah, blah, blah. All, you know, it, it's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, that's my number four. Uh, so, at number three, this is my sub. I had Pass Alou, Send Him to Coventry. Kyle, you did a great job talking about the album. What a bit special. And you should definitely go back and listen if you haven't heard our episode with Nicholas Tyrell where we discuss and break down this album. So I'm going to sub in here my first sub, which is uh, The Flaming Lips, American Head. So that album really resonated with me and definitely is in my honorable mentions and didn't quite make this list. But now I will put it at my number three because that album was really great. You know, Psychedelic Rock definitely holds a special place in my heart in like terms of how I kind of like went on a musical journey and kind of opened up to other genres. That was a pivotal kind of genre um, that like exposed me to like new things and new, new sounds. And it kind of came at a time when, you know, psych rock was kind of coming back into the forefront. So I think like everything that I heard on the album and like when we decided to review it this year, I was really impressed by it. So definitely was going to be on my long list, but it will now sit at number three. What do you have at number three? Punisher by Phoebe Bridgers. This album is, I definitely recommend uh, being sad and, you know, listening to it with some tissues. It's uh, very fantastic. She even credits Connor, she kind of credits Connor O'Burst. The songs are incredible. The first single, Garden Song, was absolutely f fantastic. Kyoto as well. I mean, it's really, really good. I know Andrew Lanza of Mind Refinery fame is just crazy about this album. And I think that it's definitely something you have to be in the mood for. I think that would be the only thing against it. Like, I'm not listening to this all the time, but um, her talent is just without you know, kind of debate at this point. And I think this album is really taking her, especially if you're looking at the year end lists, uh, is really going to take her, um, you know, to the, to a really high level in the industry. It's a certified classic, uh, straight up. Yeah. I, I, after we did the Kid Cudi review, I meant to kind of give her music uh, a chance. I still haven't definitely will take my time to, uh, go back and listen to that album. What's it, what's it called again? Punisher. Punisher. Okay. Like Frank Castle Punisher, or what are we getting? Frank Frank Castle. It is definitely. Uh, it, Does it, it have the the skull on on the cover? Yeah, it definitely sounds like her kids may have been murdered by <laughs> drug lords. Um, so I yeah, I definitely recommend listening to it. And if you want more uh, convincing, just uh, talk to Andrew Lance for five minutes. You probably won't even have to mention it. 
and uh, he'll tell you about it. My number three. Uh, was that just my number three? I'm losing track. That was your number three. I just so... had to do so much shifting around because of uh, your your uh, your list fading. Um, yeah, my, stole the cold pigs. My number two album is Fetch the Bolt Cutters by Fiona Apple. Uh, I've never really heard a pop artist experiment with percussion like this on an album, which was really fucking sick. And she really kind of goes to it on this album, uses it in a very emotive way. It's super original, different from the rest of her catalog, which really owes its sounds to elements of pop like Tori Amos and dipping back into Carol King and those, you know, tapestry, which is like big for any, you know, singer songwriter. But this uh, is way out there. I remember when I moved to the US in grade eight, Tidal came out the summer before. And when I moved, I didn't know anybody. So I just kind of sat around watching MTV till 3 a.m. every single night and listening to CDs, being mad at my parents for moving us to the United States. Um, a criminal was a heavy rotation on MTV, so it was like Shadow Boxer. It was all over the radio, and I was really, really, really into it. It's very moody. I was just, her, I love her voice, uh, very soulful. I was low key into it because when you first move to a place and you're Canadian, and you're moving to the U.S., uh, and they already kind of think you're soft. Um, you know, it's hard to explain to other dudes that you're into Fiona Apple, uh, and because we're not as liberated as we are are now when we were 14, and when you know all these guys were ODing on Corn and listening to fucking 311 and whatever. So I really followed her career. I dug Pons as well, and you know this all, but this album came out of nowhere. It's manic. It's cathartic. She's treading some heavy situations by the end of it, but it's really it's a really great album. It's been really encouraging to see an artist like her. I mean, we were talking about Paul McCartney before. Uh, take, I mean, she's not anywhere near as old as Paul McCartney, but like really who's established, take risks and push the envelope, you know, considering where she's been and where she's going. I love this album. I love Fiona Apple. I will forever be a Fiona Apple stan. So my number two pick will be uh, Special K by Callie Sway. So this album kind of came out of left field for me. I don't think I'd really heard of her before. Um, and then kind of going back um, after hearing this album, I realized she'd been, you know, featured on some other stuff that I listened to and really liked. Um, I thought it was perfect. It was bright. It was poppy. It had such a cool, unique sound as well. And I thought she did an amazing job on, on this album or EP or mixtape. I'm not sure how to describe it. I know it's certain things. I'll just call it project for now. But yeah, my favorite song, I think off of it is Bub Bump Bump is Bob Bumpin. I think everyone who I've showed this um, has had like a really good reaction to it and really enjoyed it. So I, I'm really like, think that she could you know link with some bigger producers and i think she could have like a really monumentous next couple of years ahead of her that album is fantastic on my honorable mentions list uh you're the one who told me about it and uh i think we were both kind of just in love with it right away as soon as we listened to it. absolutely uh fantastic before we lead into our number ones which are have been manipulated now I want to get into the whack albums this year. I want to talk about our two albums we each fucking hated. And why? Why don't you start us off, Coburn? Uh, so this one came in pretty recently. I think it's almost a week old or maybe a bit longer than that. And that is Playboy Cardi's Whole Lot of Red. Uh, Playboy Cardi is an artist who I was first turned on to when he was working with Awful Records in Atlanta with Father and um um McCone McConan and a few of those guys down there um he kind of transitioned from there to being with ASAP and then the new ASAP Worldwide Gang Entertainment or whatever it is um and he's been this really highly touted uh rapper for a long time uh Magnolia was an absolutely smash single um since then he's kind of had this thing where he kind of lives in this leak realm which you don't really see with modern artists too much anymore with like you know, fans just kind of living off of the hype of their leaks. And so Cardi's been that for a long time. He announced a whole lot of red, I believe, like two years ago or something like that. Um, and then since then, it's been nothing but leaks. And he's adopted this new baby voice. People were really hyped to hear him on Drake's Dark Lane demos tape because they had the song 1993 that was supposed to come out for a long time. Fast forward to, you know, Christmas Day, he drops a whole lot of red. And I think it, the album... I don't know if it had split people, but I think there was a lot of negative reactions to it. But there's a lot of really big Cardi fans who are really hyped over it. I listened to it three or four times. I really kind of maybe... Maybe Playboy Cardi is like the first artist where I feel like I kind of don't get what 
it is. I don't get what makes it tick, but I just don't really enjoy it for the most part. Like I, I do like some of his other stuff, but I don't really understand it. Like he's someone described him as rapping over Crystal Castle's beats, and I'm a big Crystal Castle's fan, but I don't really kind of get what makes Cardi. I'm definitely offended by that. Crystal Castles is good. I mean, like, he's doing experimental beats, and I think that's, you know, good. He's, like, bringing some infusion there, but I still don't really get what the hype is over him, and I don't really understand why he's, like, you know, praises the second coming when I think his music is pretty mediocre at best, if, if unless more at worst. Can I be frank about what do you Playboy? have up there? Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, for Playboy Cardi is garbaggio. I can't fucking, I can't handle it. This album is getting savaged too. Yeah, as it deserves. As it deserves. Uh, my album, first one is Daystar by Tory Lanez. Uh, th- this album has received, and it breaks my heart to, uh, you know, f- you know, fuck up a, a local guy. But uh, this album has received universal derision. Well, first of all, it's weak as fuck. Um, I'm not a big fan of Tory Lanez as it is. Yeah. But I mean, there was a lot of there was a lot of people who even refused to uh, you know to review it, and I I just like from like the Most High, how God works, um, bittersweet, all these albums, things I should have said. It's just like I just can't. Uh, it just is not good. It's not good, and also when it was released, and the subject matter, and the, I guess gang like gaslighting of um, you know of Megan The Stallion, uh, the whole thing of just from tracks to production to it coming out to like kind of around the uh, the Breonna Taylor verdict and just the whole thing was a fucking bad look. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. I think I gave it like a once over just to hear what was going on. And it's basically sim- him saying like, I didn't do it throughout the course of like a however many songs, 16 song album or whatever it was. I don't don't really need to get into Tory Lanez from, for me. I'm just not like not really here for whatever he's got going on. And he I think he just did another album like a couple weeks ago. Uh, I forget what the fuck it's called. Loner, I think is what it's called. Yes, that's what it is. He like dropped his management and his like everything. Like he's clean house pretty much. And I don't know what he's gonna gonna do anymore. Yeah, it's probably their fault that he shot Megan the Stallion. Um, yeah. Who has dealt with this with grace and stride, considering it's a fucked up situation? Uh, so my next one. Um, and funny enough, we're talking about Tori. Uh, my next one is gonna be Megan the Stallion's Good News. I thought this album, I think Megan Thee Stallion has this problem where she is really overinflated in press and media. And I don't think her music has lived up to the, to the place where she's at right now in terms of that. So I think this album, you know, suffered from uh, being rushed out. I think she's kind of, you know, been in the media spotlight a lot. She's had a really hard year. I think she, you know, she's lost close family members. She had that incident happen to her this summer. Um, I think she kind of needs time to kind of step back from music a little bit and kind of been, be given the grace to do so. Um, I think she would benefit from working with maybe a better executive producer to kind of have a, a creative vision. And I think maybe some more writers in the room would help too. Cause like some of the records on here are just not it, and especially for a rapper of her caliber. I don't think this album was, was acceptable. There's like a couple bangers on it. Initially, I was kind of, eh. but like the problem is the album is mediocre overall, and I think she can do better. And she gets too much media attention. So, like, is she a rapper who can be at that level? You know what I mean? And I don't like the the work isn't there yet to kind of prove that. Yeah, like I think like if you go back to her like freestyle in the park and everything that people got hyped up over, you had that kind of you know energy behind it. And I don't, I think her even her raps have suffered since then. So I think like you know she's doing these kind of hits, much like Drake did with Tusi Slide, where she's doing this like body oddy song that's very obviously like made for TikTok, and nothing about it feels organic or you know as culture shifting as the stuff she was doing before. So she's kind of suffering from this thing where she's done her debut album, I think two or three times now, where they've said it's a debut and then it comes out and it doesn't really get to where they think it's going to get. 
So I think there's been some other rappers who've, you know, kind of made more of their shots than she has. So I would like to see her kind of maybe take some space and, and maybe come back with a more articulated vision. Because, like, they're really kind of painting it as Nicki Minaj is the goal. Yeah, and I think there's there's other frameworks to, to look at. And I think, you know, she has Beyonce. She has these features. She's at, she's operating at a very high level. But I don't think the music is, is matching where she's kind of operating at and as much the public eye as she's in. My other whack album is Pluto baby pluto by future and lil uzi vert i mean lil uzi vert has had a big year i mean definitely all the year ends are really talking about eternal take but these guys i don't understand why they're on the same album because they don't really add any variety in terms of their styles i mean like future really hasn't had a good year i mean high off life was kind of boring and i mean i don't know if like i'm not do you think it's it's oversaturation i don't need to hear future by himself and i don't need to hear him with little uzi, little uzi vert like uh, i mean the drake album like what a time to be alive is fantastic like i really like that album a lot yeah but i mean without kind of drake's sheen he doesn't i mean it it's it's not offering anything and then they're so like did, they're you, both, did you like ds2 i mean nah. I feel like you might not be a you might not be for a future fan though because I think DS2 is like that's what that's future operating at his highest level. I think and that, that is that album I think is super solid all the way through. I think that is absolutely, um, absolutely fucking warranted. And I think I will put it this way: uh, What a time to be alive! I throw that on all the time. Yeah, but uh, like it goes on all the time. He's and he's great on it, but I've not really like enjoyed his solo stuff much. And I just and, and you know what? Valid. Not a future fan, but um, in this, like, they're not doing anything for each other on yeah. this album. Yeah, I don't think this this album's nothing. It's nothing new, and it's like I think if you're not like super into these artists, I don't think there's anything to take away from this album at all. And I think if even if you are super into the, these artists, like, you have to be like a super big fan to be like, oh, this is a good album. Because I don't think this is a good album. I think it's an album that was made, and I think that. Like, it's one of these albums that kind of keeps proving a point that we talk about on here is that, like, not everybody should collaborate all the time. Um, and it's not necessary. And I think it's, like, maybe an easy way for major artists to kind of, like, half-ass an album. Because if you both half-ass an album and you put it together, you have a whole album. And it's just a whole album of ass at that point. They're trying to, like, spread the workload? Yeah. Yeah, well, this ain't no this ain't no group science project, okay? This is... I don't know, man. Like, I, th- I was listening to it. I'm like, all these tracks sound exactly the same. And I'm yeah. like, do I have to OK Boomer myself, even though I'm not even a Boomer? And it's like, no. Um, there's just the production. Like, there's no, they don't, like, with What a Time to Be Alive, him and Drake played off each other really well. Like, you know, you had Drake coming in with that sheen, and then Future was almost like a specter coming in with his vocals and coming around it and just the dripping with auto-tune and um, it's the organic versus digital and it just was very a yin and yang type thing whereas this doesn't do that you have to it's what is everybody doing on the album right and yeah if you can't identify or they're doing the same things then you're kind of lost so what do you have for your uh, honorable mentions or albums that were left off okay so my honorable mentions um were phoebe bridgers was the number one i had to sub in uh paul mccartney three i had to sub in as well um i had two chains as well on this who i really really fucking uh so help me god uh that album was really 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 great and yeah i think i have that on my um my my subs as well like i was really surprised by how good the follow-up was to rapper go to the league like it, it just ended up being really 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 good and it was a fun album i mean the pers- the perspective isn't entirely new but it 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 just was a it's listen when you put out an album that is critically acclaimed like coming back with another one is really difficult because yeah you can try to say that you're not you know awash with your own expectations and you know or and you don't care what other people think but you do especially when they give you validation when they give you validation right after that is when they can hit you the hardest you know what i mean like it's it's really it's really hard and he was able to just kind of go with that and really kind of make it happen and um good on him for doing it i really 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 enjoyed it and i I think that was reflected in our review but that was an example of one where like limbo 
we ranked as you know we gave less you know you know a smaller review to that but you know but at the same time i kind of identify with that a bit more so like it's just kind of like what is aligning with your tastes and your sensibilities if that makes any sense yeah and i think it's also like you're kind of weighing it against you know wh where the artist is at their career and what they can achieve or what they didn't you know what they missed comparatively yes so what okay another one i had was pups album they dropped this year absolutely fantastic it was called this place sucks ass really 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 good i love fucking pup they're one of the few rock bands that are really still doing it they have that you know punk influence they're aggressive but they're unabashedly i mean they on previous albums they have songs about the fucking don valley parkway and this one has that punk ethos it was kind of living up to the angst uh that i was feeling at the time and like over this lockdown i've been listening to it's like either like a little more sorrowful stuff sometimes that's where like folklore comes in but then like you know at the same time like something that like channels you know the aggression and angst that kind of all the fucked up shit that's been happening um from the you know covid and like a racial standpoint as well like it's definitely a year to be absolutely fucking frustrated with humanity in general so they provide an adequate soundtrack for that i love the band they're toronto and it was just great to hear more stuff from them even if it was i mean my only one of my big notes would be i just want a full length lp if you know if anything yeah that makes sense i like, I like pop what about you like what are your next ones I had Flaming Lips, which I ended up using. Um, I ended up subbing in. And then I had uh, Sufjan's The Ascension, which I, re which I really enjoyed and resonated with me. I have 21 Savages, Savage Mode 2, uh, Little Babies, My Turn. I have Flo Millie, Ho, Why Is You Here? Limbo, which we talked about by Amine. Um, and then an artist named Q, and he put out a great album called The Shave Experiment. And uh, then I have Savannah Ray's album as well on uh, my, on my honorable mentions list for this year savannah ray's album is fantastic should have been on my honorable mentions it's so hard when you do this because you're trying to like go through all the things you've heard and then like your brain starts getting into like like what is represented like how many rap artists do i have how many you know what i mean and you start to almost like get in your you know get in your own head with it but i think feel like my concern is always recency bias and i, I would say like a majority of i think maybe i, I kind of have a little bit of a mix of some stuff from like may and some stuff from fall but i think it's easy to get the albums that came out you know in the fall or like you know october and those albums kind of sit at your forefront because you've engaged with them more recently and that like music hasn't really come out behind it to change it change where it sits in your in your um in your head or on your list i feel like in like me mu music uh moved very quickly this year and i was actually surprised that i don't necessarily think that the year end lists from journalists should be coming out like they were coming out at the beginning of December, but then like two major albums were dropped. I don't think they massively changed the landscape. You know, you had Kid Cudi and you had um, Evermore come out, which is just, you know, a kind of an extension of folklore, a sister album to folklore. But like, I feel like this day and age in music, it's almost you can get trapped and a crazy album could come out. For sure. And I think like it, it'd be hard though, because I think the media cycle kind of works in a way that, you know, people want those lists in December so they can start like arguing about them and, and you know, you know, making the response list. And that I think is a whole period of, of December before, you know, it gets super Christmassy that people kind of do that and break down lists and talk about what happened in the past year. I think in January, people kind of kind of shift out of that period and are kind of more like you know oh, i'm hopeful for the new year and like that kind of discussion doesn't really happen as often uh in this era yeah because i mean then all of a sudden you're like deep into like you're into january by the time the dust settles you know what i mean um yeah i, I just feel like i feel like somehow i just want to see the certified classic come out in december and just fuck up their entire list it's like it's almost like you gotta like completely revise it coburn your number one album of 2020 so my number one album of uh, 2020 is an album with the same name as Megan's album. It's called Good News, and it's by an artist named Asha Amuno. He is a 19-year-old rapper, L.A.-based. He's part of a collective. And this album I kind of only discovered uh, semi-recently, but I thought 
it was a standout album. You know, this kid is born in 2001, which blows my mind because I remember 2001. He kind of goes on this journey throughout the album. He plays into different genres, different pockets of hip hop. Um, there's a lot of great lyricism. There's some great singing on it. The production is immaculate. Um, there's a skit on it, and it's or a skit or interlude on it. It's perfect. It's concise. It's everything that I'm I usually look for in a rap album. He's kind of relatively unknown too, so I was surprised that he was producing it on the scale. So yeah, the album really hit me in a special way. Yeah, I'm definitely he definitely made a new fan out of me. My number one album of 2020 song machine uh season one strange times by the gorillas and i love this album i'm listening to this a lot um it, i just constantly listen to it in fact on my like spotify year end it was among my most listened to things it's funny because in the 90s there was this whole cooked up rivalry between blur and oasis and i enjoy oasis despite their um, atrocious football affiliations they are Manchester City fans and much was said about Oasis and the songwriting prowess of Gallagher when I was growing up especially in the 90s but at this point I mean if you're looking at the two biggest luminaries that come out of Britpop post 90s uh, the the outside outside of their you know big bands that kind of brought them into the public eye it's Damon Albarn that's really the visionary not Noel Gallagher he takes risks uh, he created this whole world around the gorillas that brings together the best of punk art rock hip-hop pop um electronic he's got robert smith from the cure schoolboy q slow tie peter hook saint vincent beck kano elton john black slaves this is such an eclectic group of people he's brought together to create what i feel like modern music should be because everything is starting to mix now and everything well i mean it's always done it you know to an extent but now because of you know unfettered access to all these different musics from one point of the world to the other like you can you can hear anything and be exposed to anything and i've been listening to it regular regularly since this drop it's not going anywhere in terms of my life and the videos cuz they kind of released it as an episodic video album and they they did the, the first tracks before the extended the extended album which was also really good They've been really cool too, the videos. And honestly, watching Albarn makes me feel better about getting older because he's just maintained his edge. He's like, wine, he gets better. And I love this album. I fucking love the Gorillas. I was a little disappointed with their last album. This one was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely a great album. And, and it definitely included, a, a, should have been, uh, been a spot on my list, I think, um, for at least honorable mentions because the album was super fantastic. What did you think over music in 2020 overall? I mean, I listen, I really, really loved it. I think that it was a weird year, and I think music was one of the things that kind of got me through it. I think you could probably say the same um, because of thing, how, how fucked up things were with the world. And, I mean, I guess my list in terms of me and how I processed the whole year represents the different facets of, of how that manifested and how that happened. Rage at times, the need for calm at times, um, manic at times. And I think that it was a great year for music, but it's the longest I've ever not seen a show. And I think that's weighing on me. I think that will be the legacy of one of the legacies of this year for me was that, you know, I had just dumped untold amounts of money into seeing bands live and going to shows is very much part of me and my fiance's um, the relationship. And I'm glad this music came out. I believe this will always, the lockdown, the idea of isolation, which we've talked about before, um, will be uh, remembered for this year and his contribution to music. But I think I can speak for everyone when I say there is a like fucking need to be around people communally enjoying music. And that's, one of the kind of lingering things. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that I'm looking forward to in, you know, not that this will end, but like, you know, the kind of post lockdown maybe era or like when we're kind of allowed to get back into seeing bands or seeing seeing acts uh, perform and how that will change the shape and sounds of music in the future. So before we go here, 
what are you looking forward to? What would you like to see from music in 2021? I think in 2021, I think I've returned by, you know, some of these bigger acts to music. You know, I think we're awaiting albums from Drake. We're awaiting albums from Kendrick and J. Cole. Um, some of these, like, luminaries of rap. Um, I would like to see, you know, maybe some smaller, more intimate albums from, you know, some bands. I would like to see, you know... I would like to see some innovative music videos too, especially if that's going to be a way that we're going to be experiencing music for a little while now. Definitely albums by some of the bigger, like we need a Kendrick Lamar album now. And uh, like, especially given that we have this podcast now and, um, you know, I really look forward to dissecting. I think especially like having con- musical conversations with you and people, you know, associated with the show and just like friends in general uh, has been one way of kind of sustaining the absence of live music. I'd love to see albums, again, you know, full albums by Drake, by Kendrick Lamar. Um, you know, uh, I, there's rumors of Rihanna dropping an album that that's going to, that that may happen. So, you know, I, but I would really, you know, I'd love to see Pasalu drop another album because, like, he just, like, the the, the real kind of embracement of UK hip-hop in my, you know, in my life has been really, really good. It's added this kind of extra element of discovery so i'm I, i'm looking forward to getting more of that hearing more of that and and just having these conversations that we've been having this year and just kind of like continuing them and you know even expanding more on it and listening to more great music and hopefully getting to a point where we can soon go see music live in the communal spot